Good morning and welcome to Carolina Cares, an iHeart Media production. I'm Tyler Ryan, and this morning we're speaking with the Commanding General of Fort Jackson, uh, Brigadier General Milford Beagle Jr., a South Carolina son coming home to serve his country and work right here in his own backyard as well. We'll start that conversation in just a couple of minutes. Stay with us. Okay, men, time to be an all-star caregiver. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments. Be there emotionally and physically. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Carolina Cares on a very special Sunday. In case you've been living under a rock or maybe you're brand new to the area, there's a little something of a of a military tie to South Carolina, as you know, uh, not only the Marines, the, the Air Force base is around, the Naval Station that, uh, that still exists uh, down in Charleston, but there's also this small little training base that also is the largest training installation in the entire world. It's called Fort Jackson. And for the last 100 years, Camp Jackson, initially as it started becoming Fort Jackson, has turned out heroes. They've created men and women who uh, I say zero to hero. You go from a, a citizen to a to a soldier to someone who uh, has honor, integrity, training, gets the very best training on the planet. Uh, and their duty, their solemn duty, is to keep us safe so we can have a Sunday morning on the radio. We can uh, enjoy time with our kids and I, I think that's a very, a very solemn thing. I think it's a very important role. But along with that are the folks who train these young people who say, I want to do this. I want to stand up. I want to raise my right hand. I'm willing to give the ultimate sacrifice. It's not for the money. I can tell you that. Uh, but to the tune of an average of 1000 a week, Fort Jackson takes young people, sometimes older, as they go, gives them that, that training, that know-how, that, that military bearing, and says, go serve your country. Uh, joining me this morning, the commanding general of Fort Jackson, newly installed, in fact, uh, within the last few months, Brigadier General uh, Milford H. Did I say that right? H. Beagle. That's correct. Junior. Got you, you got sir. got it, Tyler. I, I, don't, you've, I don't want to get the, the commanding general's name wrong. So. Good morning to you, sir. As long as you start with general, it's good. It's, it's all good. <laughs> I've been telling my wife that, but she refuses. <laughs> <laughs> Typically in the house, the wives are the general, so they outrank us. I, I was way. wondering. Yeah. I was wondering. I'm a one-star at work, and my wife's a four-star at home, so I lose either way. I love it. I, first of all, I want to say thank you to your service to your country, my friend. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure. You, uh, you, don't, you don't make rank easy, and you certainly don't become a general or a commanding general of the largest military training installation in the world without making sacrifices in service. So I, truly, I thank you. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to do what we do. I mean, we sacrifice, you know, a lot, but it's for a worthy cause. It's for our country. Sure. It's for our fellow, you know, citizens you know, in the U.S. So, you know, to thank us for what we do is something that, you know, all of us that come into service, whether it be Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, right. we raise our right hand and volunteer to do that. Yep, and that's an important distinction, too. Don't ever forget that. It is, it's a volunteer. It hasn't been to draft since, since Vietnam days. Correct. So I'm doing it voluntarily. And we're going to talk this morning uh, about the base. I want to get into a little later this morning about military service, how you and your, your 22 years? 28. 28 years. See, I just shaved off because I, I was going to give you a field grade promotion, but <laughs> you know, you're already at the top. Uh, but anyway, in, in your 28, you know, what you've seen, the, the way that we protect the country changes, you know, with time, technology. I want to get into that a bit. But first, I want to talk about you. For you coming back to Jackson, it's almost like coming back home. It's a homecoming. So it's a, it's a honeymoon that I hope it doesn't end anytime soon. But it's a good, you know, homecoming to come back. And then just the way, you know, I've been treated, the family. I mean, right. knowing a lot of folks, you know, here, not only at Fort Jackson, but just in the Midlands and seeing all those familiar faces has been great. So it's one big honeymoon that I hope lasts for two years or a little bit longer. Sure. Well, let's walk us through some of your background then. So you grew up you grew up in, in Ellery, is it? Ennery. Ennery. Yeah. Ennery. Ellery's so, a whole different town. Whole different town. All right. And, Ennery. Got it. Right. So you grew up there. Grew up in Ennery, mm-hmm. South Carolina. And, and what that means, a lot of folks don't know this, is the River of Muscadimes. Okay. Cherokee Indians gave it that name. And so as kids, we'd eat these big things called muscadimes, which right. are wild grapes. Very delicious. But anyway, different story, different day. <laughs> but grew up there, went to a smaller you know, high school uh, in the upstate Woodruff High School. Graduated there, thought my career was going to be in sports. So actually, very ironic, I got a letter from West Point, United States right. Military Academy. That's where I was going to go run track, or at least that's what they thought. Because when I got the letter, I'm like, I don't want anything to do with the military. I'm sure I'm going to you know be an Olympian or something like that. At least I thought, and decided not to go that route. But I didn't know also that I was a free ride 
Um, right. You know, college ride. So I decided to go to South Carolina State. Keep it, keep it local. Keep it within the state, mm-hmm. um, and go there and walk on for track. And I made it. So made sure. the track team there, and had a few friends that were just you know a little bit zealous, just a little bit chippy, and they kind of you know poked fun at the guy that came home in the track suit, and they came home wearing you know army fatigues, and they're like, right. hey, you probably can't do what we do. And I took the challenge, and then twenty eight years later, here I sit. Good gracious. So, so walk me then from, you know, you turned down, uh, you know, a pretty prestigious school like the Citadel. I mean, there's certain, there's certain colleges that just speak to, uh, to service and honor, you know, West Point, the Citadel. Uh, it's just one of those iconic schools that everybody knows about. So, all right. So you, you turn that down, you're at SC State. How do you get here then? Now, now we got a lot to cover. Yeah. So, and even South Carolina State, and I didn't know it then, is, is iconic in its own right, mm-hmm. because just the amount of general officers that have been produced by South Carolina State is second only to West Point. Now, again, if you do the math and in terms of ratios, West Point, by default, is the largest military academy that we have. But South Carolina State, over the Citadel, over other ROTC programs in our state and other states, produces the most general officers. Right now, we're up to 21. So produced out of one school is pretty phenomenal. Wow. And I didn't know that, you know, going there, but Mm -hmm. you, you learn those things over time. And from South Carolina State, you know, we had a great connection with Fort Jackson. So we spent most of our junior and senior year at Fort Jackson. So uh, I got a great dose of Fort Jackson <laughs> right. while I was still in college. I mean, can I ever get away from this place? And we have this very unique program uh, that sends uh, cadets back to you know a training base. Pick your place. So Cadet Beagle goes back to Fort Jackson. And I'm like, sure. okay, I just can't get away. It's my home state. I do love it. I love Fort Jackson, but I want to see something different. So early on, I just continued to get stuck you know, coming back to, to Fort Jackson, whereas right. you really want to go out and see bigger, better things, because we just know at that point as cadets, Fort Jackson like the back of our hand. Sure, and, sure. And, and a bit has changed since 28, 29, 30 years ago, and when you came to the post and said, oh, this is mine now, kids. And But <laughs> to have that res- that perspective and then the history of knowing how much has changed, and that's right. phenomenal. I mean, just from two years ago, when I was last year, and come back and see mm-hmm. the change in that short amount of time, you can tell you've got a post that's, that's relevant and that is open to change because you have to change uh, to remain relevant. If you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevancy a lot less. So again, just the folks there, mm-hmm. the commanders that have you know uh, preceded me, all get it, all understand. And then from what I understood back as a cadet, old World War II buildings, old ranges, those kind of things, to see it now is like, that's phenomenal. But you can only appreciate it if you had that history with Fort Jackson, which now I'm all fortunate. So now it all adds up. It's like, okay, here's right. why we kind of kept sending you back. I don't think anybody knew I'd come back to command, not even myself, but it's good to have that that connection. And that's, that's got to be an amazing thing to be able to walk back and, and you know, walk down the road, you know, drive, uh, you know, and just say, like, man, I remember this. Oh, yeah, yeah look at that. Yeah. That is that is such a cool thing. So you're at SC State, you're going to the RTC program, you're going to Jackson every now, uh, you know, you're spending a lot of time there. How do you get to the commission and then really kind of get on that track that ultimately uh, leads you back home? Yeah, so you you get your branch, you know, a variety of ways. And so we had a lot of infantry officers when I was a cadet, and we decided that is the hardest thing the Army has to offer. We want to go infantry, go to ranger school, go to airborne school, right. any kind of badge, you know, you can get, jump out of planes, helicopters, you name it. So you jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Perfectly good airplanes, perfectly good helicopters, and, you know, <laughs> you name it. So that was that was the life. I mean, if you want to get up close and personal with the enemy, the infantry is a place to do it, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. And right. that was a commission that I got. You go from there to Fort Benning, as we call it. Uh, it used to be the Benning School for Boys, now that, you know, Combat Arms is open for, you know, females as well, so it's, it's Benning School for everybody. And so right. we just produced our first uh, female Ranger non-commissioned officer uh, mm-hmm. last awesome. week, which is great. And you, know, awesome. you go from Fort Benning, and then, as I tell people, my career was Mississippi West, so I couldn't get away from the East Coast at first, and that's, you know, <laughs> kind of where you wanted to go to see. And so they started sending me west of the Mississippi, and it was Louisiana, Texas, Hawaii, Korea, Colorado, Kansas, and, you know, overseas deployments as well included in that. And then it full circle, you know, back around in about 2014 to come back to Fort Jackson. At that point, you're like, okay, I'm glad to come back home. So you're glad to. You're wearing me out just hearing the story, man. I feel like I'm in my passport view. (laughs) You know, I guess they weren't kidding. The poster that said, see the world, join the army. They were not kidding when it came to you, General. No, you see it. You see it all. Tell me, tell me how, in the mix of all that, so you talked about your four star at home. And, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that family serves almost, I would make the argument, even harder than, than the service member. You've got a mission. You go do it. You're focused. You get your job, d- job done. 
but there's somebody at home. There's somebody at home taking care of the family, the kids, the bills, worrying every day because you don't. You're you're, you're down range. You're worried about the bad guys and coming home. You've got family members who are serving right here. So tell me about how the misses and how the four star kind of came in and how you balanced all that early in your career. Yeah. So the the strength of any soldier is is their family, and you hit it you know square on. Is you know what the family does. I mean, wife has made many moves, and oh by the way, she's a what we call a military brat. So my father in law is a retired command sergeant major, so she's moved <laughs> quite a bit, you know, in her life. And then you add onto it twenty eight more years of you know moving, and that's how long right. we've been been married. And two boys, you know, so both kids alone. I mean, one our youngest son has got you know ten schools in twelve years. The oldest had uh, nine in twelve years. So mm-hmm. a lot of moving, a lot of different things over time, and the deployments, the separation. So the kids grow up very quick. Uh, they mature very quick. Our oldest is a second lieutenant right now, so oh, wow. a lot of things stuck to him. Just I think through osmosis and being around the peer group that they're around, going from post to post and country to country, state to state, and right. and so he decided to you know have a life of you know selfless service as well, like dad. But it was nothing that I ever pushed uh, because it is a hard a hard life for yeah. the family, and they have to take care of everything, you know, and including the spouse and. Uh, they sacrifice, I think, more than more than we do because it's dealing with schools, it's dealing with sick kids, and right. you know, you name it: soccer practice, baseball practice, football practice, yeah. those things. What do you have to worry about? MREs. That's it. You know, and yeah. they got to worry about everything. And they got to worry about everything right? else. Absolutely. When you uh, when you started out, you know, you got your commission and you start out, man, I'm going to go jump at airplanes. You know, obviously, you must have had an idea, a vision of where you wanted your career to go. You know, I want to get obviously as much ranks you can, and ultimately, you know, whatever. Was it even on your radar that a you'd make it to the to the general, you know, I'm going to be a general someday, maybe. But I mean, realistically, late at night when you're thinking about it, or do you even think for a second, or was this the whole time, man? I want to command this base. No, re- realistically, I think most of us, at least I can speak for most of my peers coming out of college, we're like four years. You know, we do the selfless service, we yeah. you know serve our country, and then we go on to, to bigger and better things. So we thought, as you you know said it earlier. If you wanted to make money, you wanted to be rich. You, you're not. You're not wearing this. You're not going to do True this. Story. And you know, so we thought, okay, we can do the right thing by country, uh, feel good about ourselves and what we're doing for the country, and then move on. And you, you're at a point where you're an apprentice, so you really don't know what you don't know. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see a lot of things change. The the teammates that you have around you, the things that you get accomplished, you know, just with the people and the impact that you have mm-hmm. is so tremendous. You're like, okay. I, I can't walk away from this. It's very hard to walk away from it. And I did not have a clue about making general. I tell folks, you know, the story about my first encounter with my first battalion commander. And, you know, very quickly I go in. And so you're, you're afraid. I mean, cause you've got all your peers there. First time you're going to meet this high ranking, you know, commander, your right. battalion commander. And you don't know what to say. You don't know what's going to come at you. And I'm watching my peers come out after about, you know, five minutes, five minute conversations. Well, Lieutenant Beagle goes in and he says, so what do you want to do? So what do you want to do in your career? Sir, I want to be a general. I That's was just said. completely, yes. I was completely <laughs> pulling that out of my pocket because I, I assume my peers said something wrong. They were coming out too quick. I, you know, and I thought that's what, you know, was expected of us. Right. But sure enough, 40 minutes later, I walk out of the office because he took the time to actually talk me through, okay, here's what it's going to take. Right. And I thought to myself, one, you actually believe me. You believe what I said. So I might want to believe what I'm saying and at least pursue what you just told me because you spent 40 minutes of your life. So right. Lieutenant Colonel John S. Lowe made a huge impression on me just because, you know, I pulled something kind of out of my, my hip pocket and he took 40 minutes of his time, you know, to walk me through, well, here's what it's going to take. Uh, and he was true every single word of it. You know, hard work, dedication, you know, a lot of sacrifice, you know, doing things right every single day and just going off those base principles, it actually got me here. Right. And, and, you know, obviously sometimes it's one conversation, right? That one, that one inspiration. We all have one. I have Mr. Hood in, in Chesterfield, New Hampshire is my, my social studies teacher. I'll never forget that guy. It's that one guy that makes right. you want to drive, says, you know what? This is a good idea. Yep. John S. Lowe was that one guy for me. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yep. And, and obviously the leadership instills, you don't get to a position of leadership, whether you're a lieutenant, captain, major, colonel, or, or ultimately general without having that own leadership to be able to instill and be able to create that, that feeling you know, to come in and be inspired because you have to inspire to lead. You, you right. know? Yeah. yeah. And it's not only if you look at the base definition of leadership, influence is a key part of that. And you just can't get that by telling people what to do. You know, part of the Army's definition is purpose, direction, and motivation. And you got to motivate. And again, you can motivate and that can be something that's, you know, external, you know, external motivation, but you got to spark it in people, that, that intrinsic motivation. How do I get you to do the right thing and do what I need you to do? But 
it's you that wants to do it, not because I want you to do it. You want to do it yourself. And how do you make that that connection? And there's you know a true statement of there's there's leaders and there's those that lead, and there's two completely different things. And you know to lead, you have to motivate and inspire a lot of folks, uh, and that causes you to be definitely inspired and motivated yourself every single day. And you can't rely on somebody to you know pump you up. It's not a quick you know pep speech and then. Off you go. You got to do that for yourself every single day because you got to do that as you go up for larger and larger, you know, formations. I love it. Speaking with the commanding general of Fort Jackson, uh, Brigadier General Milford Beagle Jr. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about a book you wrote. Mm -hmm, I heard about that. I hope you brought me an autographed copy. And also some of the changes uh, that you've seen in your 28 years of service and maybe uh, a snapshot of uh, each general comes in and wants to. Put, put a footprint and do his part to move that ball forward. Complacency is the enemy of anybody who's in service, and obviously that's that's something you want to continue to drive that ball. So we're going to come back in just a couple of minutes here on Carolina Cares. Okay, man, time to be an all-star caregiver. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments. Be there emotionally and physically. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Carolina Cares here uh, this weekend. Speaking with the the newly installed, within a month or two, Commanding General of Fort Jackson, the largest military training installation on the planet, uh, and just a, a phenomenal inst- installation, creating heroes. And I know a lot of soldiers don't like to refer to as that, but from where I sit, that's what you guys do, is you build heroes, you build people, men and women, who aren't afraid to pay any sacrifice to do their job. Uh, Brigadier General Milford Beagle Jr., a South Carolina boy, come home, and I love that. Absolutely, Tyler. Great to be home. So before we went to break, we were talking about leadership. You were sharing um, the, the conversation that may have may have arguably turned your tide in, in your view on your service and how long you might stay in more than four years, and 28 years later, you're still <laughs> looking back. And Remember that guy's name? When doing research for you, sir, I, I come across a book, some of the reviews, great for anyone, military or civilian, uh, highly recommended, very motivational, perfect for leaders. You know, and, and just even from that, it's very clear that whether it's that, that gentleman that you talk to, whether it's inside you, you, you've really kind of stepped into that leadership role. To, to be able to hand that out, not just say beat your face or not drive me here because you're the boss. <laughs> yes, sir, I will. <laughs> right. But but you really like you said there's leaders and those who lead. There's this difference. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll do the right things. You're going to make me beat my face or front leading le- rest position, or I'm going to do it because man, I'm going to do it because I want to be like him. Right. Exactly it. And so you know, with with the book, I mean, that was I think a compilation of just you know things you learn or things I learned over time and just putting those all together because right. the the unit at that particular time that I inherited it, you know, was just not that great. There was a lot of things that weren't right. And so, again, we, we talk about our kit bag and our toolkit of things that we have. And I was reaching for every single tool in that kit bag to figure out how to get things right because you can't just do it with, like you said, the direction. I can just tell you, make you, right. you know, provide the purpose. You know, you, you've got to motivate. you got to do all three. And, and things just were not working. And so, at the end of the day, using every tool at my disposal and some, some tools I didn't know I even had, mm-hmm. you know, things came out great. I mean, the unit just turned around, I mean, complete 180 uh, to a lot of, you know, accolades and, and, you know, platitudes, you name it. And as I walked away from that unit, a lot of those soldiers and those that were around said, you need to write a book about that. I'm like, oh, I didn't do anything special. They're like, well, you need to write a book about that. I'm like, I'm not writing a book about that. It's just not going to happen. And two years later, just kept getting pinged and pinged. And so really, when you look at that book, I mean, it's just a compilation of just things that I just, you know, learned and understood that worked. Um, but they would work for anybody. And it's just, how do you motivate? I mean, something as simple as there's one chapter about notes. And so I picked it up from an old boss of mine, write handwritten notes, you know, all the time. Yep. And I write tons of them because I learned that from someone else. But you'd be amazed at what you can get just with your own handwriting, telling somebody, thank you, I appreciate you, yep. great job, means the world to them. And then what you can get out of that person is just, you know, priceless. Right. I love it. And, and in full disclosure, I don't think the general knew I was going to ask about the book. I just happened to find it on Amazon when I was looking up you, sir. So it's called The Rock. So I'm going to give you a free plug, although that's a, a surprise to you. Yeah. So the, there you go. Yeah, Rock is a good read. <laughs> I'll, I'll just put it that way. You know, again, something that um, didn't have a desire to do, but, you but it's, be proud it's of there. It, though. It's, it's out there. And... So so you uh, we talked a little while earlier. You've, you've been serving for 28 years. Uh, you spent a lot of time young in your career. In fact, through your career, been in and out of, of Columbia and Fort Jackson. What are some of the the big changes that you've seen in the way the military, whether the Army or just maybe the military as a whole, 
how things have changed. I mean, yes, there's the invent of, of technology and drones and all these different warfare and different things. But, you know, reaching back 28 years to 2018, what are some big sweeping differences? I think I can sum that up in almost one word. I mean, the biggest change is access. And so if you go back to Desert Storm as an example and how we got into, you know, Iraq and those places. Right. You always had access. I mean, so when you look at the combined forces that we have, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, I mean, we can get in anywhere we wanted to. And there was not going to be much of an argument or much of a fight or much pushback because with the Air Force, you know, with top cover, the ground forces, you know, Army, Marine, we can get in anywhere we wanted to. Panama, you name it. Over time, what the, you know, our threat has learned is, you know, anti-access aerial denial. So now you deny us from distance, and you can do that in a lot of ways. You can do that through cyber. You can do that through physical means of, you know, where do you expand your spaces? So you take a place like China. When you look at what they're doing in the China Sea and then trying to expand, they push further out. So now it's going to be harder for you to get in. It's like a boxer with, you know, with reach. So if right. somebody has reach on you, how do you get in? You know, and, and now that's the biggest challenge for us is, you know, fighting those systems. So the new way of warfare, if you will, is – multi-domain operations. So we've all fought together. It's always been about combined arms. You take all the the arms of a service that you have and you leverage those together. The Army's done that well. We do that well with the other services, Mm -hmm. but now we have to do that in a different way. So it's not a mere fact that Air Force can go in and create an opening and we get in. We're going to have to do that more simultaneously than we've ever done before because now the threat understands what we have to do most is just keep you out. Keep the U.S. forces out and we're okay. And the harder we make that, the harder it's going to be for you. And the more energy and effort you got to put in to get into a country. So that's where you see a lot of investment, you know, Russia, China, you know, the major threats that are out there uh, trying to do. And so that's where you see the, the biggest change in warfare. How do we, in turn, use technology? How do we penetrate, you know, a bubble, you know, of a space that we need to get into where they've put all efforts into essentially, you know, blocking the door? And, you know, and we talked a minute ago about complacency and you're right. So that changes how we train, whether it's advanced training or just from the, the 18 year old who raises his right hand, you know, that training starts the day they get off the bus. When they see that first campaign hat and go, oh my God, what have I done? Yep. You know, where, yeah, yeah. where that starts, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's going to be a constantly moving target for you uh, and a difficulty, you know, for you obviously leading down uh, to, to your command staff, to your drill instructors, ultimately to the soldier. Uh, you know, that they constantly have to be nimble, too, because even five years ago, technology like that. And since we've been talking, something has changed. Right. And but with Fort Jackson and what we do and, and you hit it in terms of we transform, you know, civilian volunteers into, into soldiers in 10 weeks. But as you compare that to you know, how warfare has changed, when you start at the basic level, not a lot has changed there over time. I mean, you could talk to gentlemen that went to or, or ladies that went to basic training, you know, back in the 70s, 80s. A lot of the base fundamentals and the, the structure is pretty much the same because it's the basic fundamentals. You sure. always train for certainty. You educate for uncertainty. And so, you know, they're going to go through a lot more technical schools, different type of, you know, development schools that will help you know, educate them for uncertainty. But when it comes to training for the basics, you've got to know how to shoot and shoot well. That's what we do at Fort Jackson. It's a key part, three weeks of what they get in basic training. You have to know how to, you know, protect yourself, camouflage yourself, equipment, survive, those type things. We, we go through shoot, move, communicate, survive, and adapt. So if you know, in 10 weeks we can teach all soldiers to do those five basic things right. very well, everything else you're going to learn. But if you don't have the basics, you know, it's back to a football analogy, if you can't block and tackle, don't try to blitz, don't try to run a fancy play because you're not going to get there. So we build that basic you know, right. building block for the rest of the forces, the rest of the schools to, to layer onto that. And then now you can adapt because that education that they will continue to get, you know, to include officers, that's going to educate them for, you know, uncertainty. Right. But then the training piece is you got to be reflexive at whatever you do at the basic level. And, and I think that's the, the important part, having that foundation. You can't build a house without that. And that also ensures, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in the Army, you're not going to hang with your best, your best buddy for 28 years. You're going to move around. You're going to meet soldiers from across the world. I know that if I'm in a hole with you and I just met you two minutes ago, you and I at least know how to protect each other, protect your battle buddy, because we've had the same, whether it was you know, at Fort Sill or Jackson, the same basic training, the same foundation is exactly the same. Exactly. And, and we know how to, to communicate. So all the way down to communication. You know, if we start rattling off you know, a lot of different acronyms or you know, just the, 
uh, phonetic way we pronounce, you know, things, we're going to know. So we can communicate. We can shoot together. We understand all the base fundamentals regardless of, you know, where we train because our base skill set is, is the same and is solid across the board. Speaking with uh, Brigadier General Milford Beagle Jr., he is the Commanding General of Fort Jackson, our our fun little paradise here. Uh, it's such it's such a huge imprint too. I know with the fort, and some people forget, you know, what a big impact this fort has. Not only just you know with with pumping out a thousand sh- soldiers a week, but people who train the soldiers live here. So sure, the kids kids are here for for ten weeks and are gone. But there's you and your command staff, all these civilian support staff, the people, the employees of the base, the, the drill instructors. That's a humongous financial footprint that you add to this community. Right. And so just given, you know, green suitors, as we call ourselves, you know, the soldiers alone. And it's not only just soldiers. We have sailors at right. Fort Jackson. We have Air Force, you know, some very small numbers uh, at Fort Jackson. And you have Reserve and you have National Guard. So the different compos of you know the the army are there and about 3500 total when you look at just the green suits and then civilians about 3500 more civilians our workforce that comes in every day and supports everything that we do uh, across the board and then as we you know graduate that thousand plus you know per week i mean just the the inject into the economy is 2.4 million billion dollars uh you know per year right. and you get about 36 40 of that just from the folks that come in to Fort Jackson Every single week. So you, you'll have right. up to 6,000 families from across all 50 states and territories, and in some cases overseas, that will come to Fort Jackson every single week that come in to see graduation ceremonies. And I think that's an important thing. The reason I mention that whenever I can is because I don't care about the Army. Why does that matter to me? Well, you have a job. You may have a job because of someone else. You may have a job at a restaurant because the Army supports that because you have Army guys who come in. So it's a big cog, and that's, and that's why I was – like to make that point that somebody who may not know a darn thing about the army, they may be employed, they may have a home, a family, a brand new car because of Fort Jackson. I, I think that's important. Right, and and you have to understand that why. So when you pull it, you know, always start with why. You pull that string and see, okay, why does this, you know, work this way? Why am I employed? Or you know, why do I need to have an interest in Fort Jackson? But again, our profession is based on trust with the American public, right. and so again, you're the public that we serve. So. You need to come and see what it is your your army you know does, and whether you're close to a marine base or air force base, it's the same thing. And granted, there's some things that are you know shrouded in secrecy, but you know for what we do at Fort Jackson, you know just the basics and how things work and how we transform civilians, volunteer civilians, into soldiers is worth everybody coming to see and understand exactly what does your army do and how do they do it. Uh, should make you sleep a lot easier at night just knowing you've seen how it's done. You understand it. Now I can truly rest easy. And if there's somebody knocking at our door, they won't be knocking for long because you know how they're produced and you know right. the goodness that comes out of Fort Jackson. I love it. Commanding General, Brig- Brigadier General, Commanding General of uh, Fort Jackson, uh, Milford Beagle Jr. My friend, once again, thank you for your 28 years of service and I'm sure many more to come. Uh, you know, sit in here and, and welcome back home. Uh, you know, you can just be here for the next 30 years if you want. Yeah. You know, whatever you want. No, Tyler, this has been <laughs> great just being here with you. I mean, always, always a pleasure to spend time with you and just kind of go through. Wish we had, you know, more time as we talked before. I could sit here and, you know, talk to you all day. But, but I would just, you know, leave one last message and tell folks, you know, not only in Columbia and the Midlands, but, you know, lower state, upstate where I grew up, you know, they need to come see their army. It's their army. That's one thing I want them to do and understand that and truly understand that gym that we have in our our backyard, call Fort Jackson because we are the biggest dog on the block. And, you know, senior leaders have told me the Army goes however Fort Jackson goes. You will not apply that to any other post in this country, and we do more than the other three, you know, training facilities, installations combined. And that that is a huge, huge deal. And knowing that we have that in South Carolina is absolutely awesome. Fantastic. Sir, pull links for you for Fort Jackson, the, uh, the Come Meet Your Army and the great – things they do for the community as well, all based on the four. Put links for you. VOC, I just log on the, the uh, Carolina Cares link, and we'll definitely have the general back on again because uh, there's a lot more we didn't get t- chance to get into, but we certainly want to. So thank you for your service, General. Stay with us. Carolina Cares is coming right back. When it comes to parenting, there are no perfect answers, but that's okay because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. 
Welcome back to Carolina Cares. Great, great stuff today from the general. Uh, very inspirational. No kidding. No wonder he wrote a book, right? Uh, it just great information. We'll put links for you at, uh, at WVOC, the Carolina Cares tab. This has been Carolina Cares, an iHeart Media production. My name is Tyler Ryan. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we'll talk to you in seven days.